Hello. It's time once again for the final exam review. Uh, for those of you who are in the great quarantine of 2020, uh, you will have a window in which to take the exam and I'll post the password to get access to it at, uh, at the appropriate time. For the rest of you, no, you have to take the exam in the class on the day that's regularly assigned for final exams. So uh, just with that clarification in mind, let's go ahead and go on. I uh, wanted to run through these terms. I want you to understand that as we're talking terms, don't just think about memorizing a, a specific definition. Rather, understand the concept and look at how words tie into each other, how concepts are related. Uh, it'll help you actually with study. Instead of memorizing uh, to 150 different terms, you organize them in maybe 50 to 80 sets of concepts and it may be and I think it's easier to remember that way if you can think more systematically so let's go ahead and go let's get started uh, HTML hotmail <laughs> no it's not hotmail it's HTML hypertext markup language basically this is the basic language for usage of the internet it's gone through many developing stages I think current it's like hotmail 5 uh, I mean HTML5 but it's the basic protocol language for interaction on the internet. What's a URL? Universal Resource Locator. That's the address uh, that uh, for somebody that you're requesting information from. Remember, you have an IP address and when you're working on the internet and then you send off a request for information and uh, to the URL and then it will provide the answer and send it back to your specific address. By the way, uh, you can have two different types of uh, IP addresses, uh, the static or the dynamic. A static one is fixed. It does not change. Uh, our radio station, for example. We have a, a radio station base station for our remote uh, broadcast, and then we have the device we take in the field. Well, instead of the two devices always having to look for uh, whatever the new address might be, uh, the base station has a specific address, so when we plug in the uh, remote box and connect to the internet and say find home, if you will, go back to the control room, it knows the address to go to. Another example of the use for a static would be uh, for people who have uh, VoIP, voice over internet protocol, uh, telephone, internet telephone. The Normally, when you get on the internet, you would have a uh, you get just an address and they just pick them out of a, a, a bunch of addresses and they give you one for as long as you're on the internet and then when you get off the internet it uh, you abandon that address and then somebody else will get it for while they're as long as they're on the internet it'll go back to their computer that would be a dynamic uh, inter uh, IP address you see not every, we're not always living well, most of the time we're not always living on the internet. We don't have to have one fixed IP address. But uh, in order to save the number of addresses, they reuse them. And every time somebody just drops in on the internet, like say when you log in on your computer or with your cell phone, you get assigned an IP address as long as you're on uh, through that location. On the other hand, a static our fixed IP address, remember the other one that changes is dynamic. The static one lives uh, permanently with that resource. Let me go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and center up. I like that better. Um, like this, for example, when I was getting back to talking about voice over internet uh, protocol, you know, the telephone, internet telephone. Well, we when we got that set up, we had, um, uh, we still needed 911. Well, 911 would, uh, if we make a 911 call, it would look to try to figure out where we were calling from instead of us having to say our address. It would automatically log where the call was coming from. Well, if you have dynamic IP addresses that constantly change, there's no way for that IP address to automatically say, oh, I am calling from, you know, so and so and so and so on this street. So they would assign to us a fixed IP address. That way, when that IP address came through the switchboard, it would register with our house, with our address, because it was assigned fixed 
to that address. So that's the purpose of the two types of IP addresses. Fixed, uh, fixed IP addresses always stay with that particular entity. Dynamic uh, will always be changing depending on who's on the internet at the time. and They get reused. Uh, other terms, uh, domain name, that's, you know, ngu.edu. You know, it's the name of your website, your domain. Uh, the ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Okay, basically those are the people who keep track of the uh, IP addresses uh, are the, you know, the numbers that make up the URL and the name attached to them. It keeps a registration of how they're married together. You have to register a name and then it's assigned an IP address uh, with the R uh, URL address. Uh, uh, hypertext transfer, okay, and that's HTTP. It means basically a hypertext transfer protocol. It's the basic underlying protocol rule structure used by the World Wide Web and it defines how messages can be formatted and transmitted and what actions the web and web servers and browsers can take to the commands. Basically, it's their common language, if you will. Not only the language, but also the method of operation. That's what HTTP is. Now, packets. Packet, um, the way we would do packet transmission. If you think in terms of a continuous stream of data, you know, let's say I'm, I've got device A talking to device B, and it's you know like a two telephone uh, lines. Well, I can send information this way and back and forth, and we can talk to each other, but nobody else can get on that line, not without causing confusion. Now, we got a lot of stuff going on the internet, and if we maintained a continuous feed, and there are places where they use that, but they don't really use it on the internet, uh, at, you know, extensively because it would chew up too many lines. So what they do is instead of sending out continuous feed, they send out packets of information. So I'm sending packets of information. Let's say you're watching this on, uh, on uh, Blackboard. Okay, Blackboard is not sending you out a continuous stream of video. It's sending out packets of video. And then your computer is buffering. Remember that term? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, it's letting those packets land and then rebuilding the video sequence. So it looks smooth to you, but it's actually assembled by the packets of video content and audio content that are being sent out. Well, why is that important? Well, between the packets of the content that's going from uh, Blackboard to you, somebody else may be sending out other packets that have a different address that's going somewhere else. So they can use the same pipe and then go their different ways because instead of it being continuous stream that would keep would be butting up against each other, it's this packet goes here, this packet goes there, and so on and so forth. And that's how information is sent out. Even seemingly continuous stream stuff like video or audio. It is sent out in packets as well. It allows more people to use the web simultaneously. The, uh, let me see, uh, web languages, uh, you know, they are, uh, we, basically it's how computers talk to each other and they've been pretty well standardized. Now, the key though with, uh, is knowing how to tell things to work and that's where coding comes in. So you need to have the basic understandings of how the languages work. The, uh, there are a lot of applications, however, that are already pre-coded, and so it's more user-friendly, so you don't have to know how to code them yourselves. You just have to know how to use the instructions and the format that, in the app that somebody else has already built. Now, uh, languages in the broader sense for computers go way back from the very beginning of when computers were used. In fact, I'm looking, seeing articles now about COBOL being uh, needed, uh, people who know COBOL, uh, which was when the, for the unemployment processing, because so many, which is sad to hear, but you know, it's just different languages for giving instructions to computers for them to do what they need to do. And so web languages, the same thing. It's languages for interaction between devices on the web. Uh, remember, eight bits make a byte uh, units of data. Uh, metadata is the um, 
data about. Okay, now what do I mean by that? If, uh, let's say, when you log in to watch a, uh, a video on YouTube, well, information is pulled from your usage, uh, how long you watched, when you stopped watching, uh, things like that. And the metadata is collected by all the users of a particular piece, and they use that, uh, uh, that metadata to kind of see what works, what doesn't. Uh, analytics are based in uh, metadata. Uh, emojis, you know, the little smiley faces, whatever it is. Because uh, text has a hard time showing facial expression, we have emojis which give you facial expression. Uh, coding, we talked about writing instructions for apps, open source. That means it's out there so anybody can use it. Um, you know, open source materials, you're not necessarily having to pay for it. Uh, open source types of apps such as OpenOffice, uh, it's out there available for people free of charge. Now, uh, often open sources will say, hey, if you want to support this fine product, send, uh, please give us a donation. But uh, open source generally, I mean, is not paid for. It's free access. Uh, software packages for building websites. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, WordPress, Wix has been very popular. Um, those, uh, in those, instead of uh, save people the uh, hassle of try having to learn to code, learn how to build websites, instead people build templates that you can go in and access. And uh, they're very handy, uh, a very easy way to get started, if you will, working with the web. When you take um, a senior sim, yeah, you're going to be building a uh, Wix or similar type website uh, for sharing your portfolio. Compression. Okay, that video data is horribly dense. There's a lot of information there. So, and the same thing is true with music, pictures, images, raw pictures are very uh, data heavy. So they compress them. Now with video, they would do things like instead of rewriting every full frame, only write what changes in the frame from frame to frame. So, uh, you know, it can, uh, it can be, uh, it won't require as much individual, as many individual bits of data. Uh, it's just a way to make the same type of image fit down through, a, take up less space as it goes through the pipe. And uh, this is, goes back to the question of bandwidth. The more bandwidth you have, the bigger the pipe for sending the information, um, the more stuff that can get through. And if you're uh, processing big, heavy-duty files, you need a lot of bandwidth. I'll give you an example uh, where compression comes in handy. When I did, uh, think this is a print equivalent, but you know, basically compression does the same thing for video. The When I used to make our Christmas letter, I would build JPEGs in. So I'd take the, little, I'd take the JPEG of this picture and I'd, you know, box it and put it in and then I put my text and made like a little newsletter for the family. Well when it came time to email it out it was horrendously long because what I had was I had full I, had, I may have eight full JPEGs in with my text that's a lot of data but I found that if I exported that letter as a PDF it compressed it made a very nice piece and uh, it took up a whole lot less space and it was much easier to send. You know, if I send it to somebody, they would say, you know, they would try to download the attachment. And it, I mean, these were the days before uh, everybody had DSL or similar type of uh, high bandwidth. You know, it would just take a long time for that letter to come through. Well, video works the same way. Uh, you know, as we've developed the technology, we've gotten better and better means of uh, compressing video. And so you can look at HD video on YouTube now, and it used to be you were scrimping along with SD, and that still uh, was glitchy because it took so much stuff to send down the pipe. So uh, compression is a very important part. By the way, a codec is a video coder and decoder. Uh, whenever you're working with um, your exports on your video, you need to know what kind of codec you're trying to send it to. This would be in your preferences as you set up the export file.
uh, whenever you're when you're getting ready to export. Okay, let me see. Citizen journalist. <laughs> it seems like everybody is. Uh, we just. Uh, I'm going to kind of date this, but we just had tornadoes come through uh, uh, the area last night. This morning, yes, we were hunkered in under the uh, the staircase. The uh, some some buildings just blown apart. There was a death. Trees ripped apart everywhere. Uh, so what's happening? People are posting their pictures of what happened. You go to uh, you go to uh, Facebook, and you're seeing the story apart from the news broadcast. Uh, when I was in, uh, I was filling in for uh, a local talk show host, Bob McLean, uh, one tax day. Well, what also happened that tax day was the Boston bombing at the Boston Marathon. And we were trying to get information. You know, here I'm on the air. I went to Facebook. That's where I got my first pictures of people who were there posting their images before I saw anything on Fox, the uh, national news affiliate, national news station. Now, that's kind of an informal citizen journalist, but people do take it seriously, and there are people who are forming their own news agencies. They're not connected to, uh, you know, any of the major networks, any of the major uh, news agencies or anything like that. They're just starting to tell their stories. There's concern about it, and there is praise for it. The praise is that anybody and everybody can tell the story and from their perspective and they can see things that maybe others don't. The negative is that people can take um, the story and then shape intentionally and possibly distort uh, the truth of the story. So, you know, it's got, there's good and bad to the state uh, question of citizen journalist. Cookies. Ooh. Actually, I like cookies. I just don't like them on my computer. They're little bits of uh, software that live on your computer and then report back to whoever put it there your computer usage uh, how your web searches and things like that uh, it's kind of like Facebook you know if uh, if I go search for something on Amazon I'll see ads for it on Facebook you know they have cookies and they look for that information uh, JPEGs as opposed to raw files remember when I talked about compression uh, well, JPEG is a compressed type of file for images as opposed to raw. Now, when people are doing their processing and uh, doing their uh, Photoshop work and all that, they like raw files because that gives them the most data-rich source to work with. But, you know, uh, raw files themselves are very large. They, take a, they require a lot of data. So uh, when you're time, it's time to export, you export as a JPEG usually, so it can work better with other people's computers and take up less space. Now, oh, the internet. I got a dog up here. Here's my dog, one of my dogs right here. There she is. And uh, she's liking attention. Uh, that's Maggie. Okay, um, uh, back to Internet of Things. It's when computers talk to computers as opposed to with the, the intervention of a human agent. For example, uh, when you have a smart meter on your home for your power and the central uh, grid control of the elect at the power plant uh, will talk to your, uh, your uh, smart meter and say, oh, we need to decrease power consumption because it's the middle of the summer and we're hitting peak usage right now when something's going to go down. So let's reduce everybody's usage. And it talks to the power that talks, uh, I mean, the power company talks to your smart meter, which then talks to your, uh, your thermostat and adjusts it accordingly. So the machines are talking to each other to head things off. Um, and there are various other, you know, systems like this where machines talk to machines and they can even use it through the internet. Uh, to uh, make our lives easier, or so they say. The uh, algorithms, uh, those are the simple if this, then this type of formulas that are used uh, you know, to help uh, select maybe what kind of products you might be interested for advertising and things like that. Uh, they, uh, but they use algorithms. Uh, if you frequent certain websites, they may send you uh, see a certain interest in topics and then that's what shows up in your news feed more often. 
uh, analytics. Uh, that's uh, basically taking the metadata and then uh, giving information about how people are using your content. Uh, it's a very big area uh, for um, marketability, actually, if you want to work, be more and more working with social media. Uh, a study in analytics and having an understanding of it can be very beneficial uh, because people like to know how people are using their content so that they can uh, better predict uh, you know, its effectiveness maybe for sales, maybe for getting the message out for whatever. Auto-tuning, okay, uh, that's when they will take, uh, this is usually used when people uh, kind of use for creating new content. Auto-tuning is where they'll take a person speaking and then they will uh, put it to different pitches so it can sound like they're making a tune. Uh, now, I, it originally was a way to bring people who might be out of tune uh, more into tune for a, a musical piece, but now people are having fun with it where they'll do maybe a series of news clips of people and then they'll make, the mu make their voices as they're speaking sound like they're singing and things like that. Uh, mashups. This is when you take content from two or more sources and then you cut it together to mash up various things to make a particular story. Uh, let's say you might have a battle between Captain Kirk and uh, Luke Skywalker, you know, as their plotting strategy. And, you know, they cut from the two movies uh, to build the story. Um, recuts, taking uh, one source and then cutting it up to make it say something else or to shorten a story. Uh, machinima, machinima, uh, it's when they take uh, video that was produced from a video game, like maybe telling a war story using something, using video that they generated through Call for Duty, Call of Duty. Um, I had a student one time who submitted a daydream about driving a Ferrari. And he built the daydream, pulling the video off of a uh, Ferrari-oriented uh, uh, driving uh, video game. And the video looked amazingly good. Uh, instead of having to create new animation, what you do is you use a, you let the animation be generated by a video game or a similar type resource. And then you edit that together, even dubbing the voices to build your story. Uh, fair use. Okay, fair use is basically their all intellectual property falls under the copyright uh, laws, which is to your benefit because copyright laws protect your ownership of your content. But there are certain areas where fair use uh, is granted to use other people's content. For example, if I'm doing a movie review and maybe I pan the movie. Uh, well, if I use content from the movie, commentary is considered fair use. Uh, that's why satire is considered a form of uh, commentary. So Weird Al Yankovic gets away with his Weird Al stuff. The, um, that would be an example. The, another use is for educational. I, if I were to say y'all need to watch, oh, for example, when I show... Uh, the videos in class, those fall under fair use because they're for educational purposes. So there are uh, certain areas that fall under fair use. Uh, don't presume fair use. Uh, in the book, they talk about what the specific parameters are. I also have it in uh, the Blackboard. So uh, look up. Don't just assume fair use, especially in churches. Uh, make sure you have rights to the stuff you're using. I used to work for a publishing house, and I've been to places and then looked at photocopies of the material that was produced by my company. It's called stealing. So make sure you are covered under fair use. Don't just presume it. Uh, the digital community, that's basically your community online, the community that you build. Uh, the hashtag, the little pound sign, it's a way to make sure that uh, you can kind of link content uh, so that people have interest in a particular subject, they just put in the, the hashtag and that topic and then it'll call up uh, all the resources along that content. Uh, a meme, a picture, 
that's used recurrently and that kind of grows with the telling as uh, people change, uh, put in new text and put funny hats. Uh, for example, when the, the queen uh, spoke and uh, she was wearing a green dress, which she should never do because people were putting all kinds of clothes on her and that became a meme, you know, as people posted. Uh, you know, the cat video, the cat images that people keep on checking. Oh, popular one, the screaming lady and the, and the cat, you know. Uh, you know, that would be a meme. Microblogging. This, in, as opposed to long blogs, these would be just short, frequent blog, uh, posts that people put online. Uh, you know, like Twitter or something like that. A physical meme. Yes, I did the ice water uh, ALS challenge, except I did it for cystic fibrosis for my cousin who passed away uh, for cystic fibrosis. Uh, planking. Uh, sometimes the physical memes are just fun, but sometimes people do stupid stuff. Please don't do stupid. That's all I can say. But they, but a, a physical meme is when somebody gets a crazy idea and then everybody else sees if they can do it. Uh, podcast. That's an audio file uh, that people post accessible via the internet. Usually it's in like an interview format. Uh, it's a way to get your content out accessible on demand. Uh, as opposed to video on demand, it's audio on demand or content on demand. Now, uh, CEO, search engine optimization. What is this? Well, it's a, uh, there are companies that will work to help you uh, make sure that you have the right taglines and the right exposure and the right placement, uh, sponsored ads, things like that, to help make sure that you would have you will show up at the top of people's searches. Uh, they, um, it's a service offered. If uh, because how many times do you scroll go past the first two pages in the search? Well, SEO tries to push that particular. Uh, vendor, you know, let's say if you're selling something, to the top of the list or close to the top so they, uh, they optimize people's exposure when they go through a search. That would be SEO or search engine optimization. SOPA is the Stop Online Piracy Act, which, um, you know, it's basically protect your rights as a content producer. Uh, transmedia. This is really a growing thing. In fact, if you're interested in news and telling stories for news, uh, you you might go in and you might have to uh, write, you know, you shoot your standard news package. Then you may have to repackage it for online and then take your uh, script and then turn that into a 100-word write-up that would go on the website. So, you know, it basically you've got, you're developing content for more than one. Um, one, more than one format or exposure. I remember when I was uh, asked about interns for a radio station, a big radio station, they said, uh, okay, we need somebody who can take a story, take a 400 word story and, you know, compress it down to 100 words for viewing on the website. Oh, but also they need to be go out, able to go out into the field and, uh, uh, record interviews that we could use sound bites for and take the pictures and uh, go ahead and record some video on it too you know not nothing much <laughs> you know but honestly that's the way a lot more of the content is being viewed there you know you may have the same story but you want to present it in multiple uh, formats for multiple types of exposure. In fact, we won an award for that here in South Carolina with our coverage of the um, uh, homecoming a couple of years ago. We had a news package, we had a story write-up, and then we had a video, uh, uh, a video collage, I mean a still blog, video, whatever that's called, <laughs> you know, where they just took still pictures and made a, pardon me, I uh, told the story that way. So, uh, yeah, you use multiple formats to tell a story. And again, that's growing in popularity. Uh, a trope. This is where you have a, uh, basically it's a fancy word for a cliche. You take a word uh, and you use sort of a figurative meaning rather than its literal meaning. And that figurative meaning kind of takes on a life of its own. And it's used repeatedly and to the point where sometimes it just becomes cliche. Um, uh, let's see. Now, in video production, let's, let's shift some gears here. 
Um, this is where I, uh, hopefully you've learned a lot of this up previous stuff through uh, you know your other classes and this is just a review. Now with what we've talked about with video production, DSLR, uh, you've used those all the time, digital single reflex lens, uh, lens reflex system. Um, the Basically it looks like a camera that you would use except not only can you shoot uh, uh, stills, you can shoot video with it. So a DSLR. CCD and CMOS are two types of imaging chips that are used to convert your video uh, from light into an electronic signal. Depth of field, that area in front of the camera where, you're, where you have focus, uh, it would be a depth, let's say, 10 feet out from your camera to 7 feet out from your camera. And that's where everything inside that area, no matter how much you zoom in, would be in focus. Now, depth of field is affected by three key components. That would be your aperture. The larger your aperture, the shallower, you know, so say with your, you have your aperture fairly open, I mean fairly close, you know, closed in, you might have this type of, uh, of uh, depth of field. You know, the camera's over here and then the subject's over here. Um, but as you open up your iris, your depth of field, that area where you have focus, is uh, closer together, shallower. So aperture affects your depth of field. The bigger your uh, aperture, you know, the, uh, the smaller your f-stop, the uh, bigger your aperture, the smaller your depth of field. The, uh, the smaller your aperture, the higher the f-stop, the uh, larger your depth of field. So the, the more area in front of your camera where you have focus. The next thing that affects uh, depth of field would be your focal length, the length of your lens. Uh, the shorter your focal length, the larger your depth of field. The longer your focal length, the smaller or shallower your depth of field. So that's why if I'm going to get a shot, I tell my students in uh, video production to use IFS in you go in all the way, focus on, like say on the nose, and then come back out. In, focus, then you set your shot. Now what's going to happen is that uh, you could be zoomed in or out, and, as long, and anywhere at that distance, you'll have focus on me. But let's say you just set up on a shot of me right here, and then uh, without checking your focus, well, the director, uh, you may decide, no, I want to zoom in on that for the video. But when you start zooming in, you're out of focus on your subject because the actual critical focus, that's where, you know, when you zoom in and you have your narrowest uh, depth of field, maybe five inches in front of the person's face. So now they're out of focus. They, it may, when you were shorter focal length, they may have been in focus because you had a much larger depth of field. But when you get make that depth of field very small, it may be five inches in front of their face. So just something to be aware of. Uh, you always want to make sure you zoom all the way in if you can. Well, this sun is playing some tricks on me, isn't it? Um, so I'm trying to shift. The uh, So depth of field. Uh, the third thing that affects depth of field is your camera to subject distance. The farther away a subject is from the camera, the larger the depth of field to the point where uh, if you look on the lens you have the little figure eight you know symbol that means infinity that means literally at that point when they're beyond that distance and you set the camera there everything beyond is in focus you know as much as you can see because things are so far away uh, color temperature for sunlight actually it's starting to be you know this looks kind of funny you see how it's bluish over here and this is yellow well that's because we've got a setting sun that's coming through the trees over there uh, but uh, sunlight is blue um, fluorescent light is green incandescent light is white to yellow and firelight is red uh, remember the colors of the rainbow Roy G. Biv, red orange green blue indigo and violet uh, cooler comfort color temperatures, which would be reds. Uh, uh, the yellow light, incandescent light, is uh, 28 to 3200 degrees Kelvin. Fluorescent light is about 4800 degrees Kelvin. Sunlight is anywhere from 56 to 65 
uh, 100 degrees Kelvin. Your standard LEDs, usually around the 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin range. And, uh, you know, but you can buy LEDs uh, that are tuned to a particular color range, wavelength, or color temperature. Uh, look space. Okay. Let me see if I can do this right. Okay. Remember we talked about the rule of thirds, you know, the you got this where you got this, and then you had the two lines coming this way and divided up in thirds. I posted a video on this. Well, usually what he was saying was you uh, put your subject on one of those thirds, and and that gives you a look space. It means as a person is talking, you're giving them space to talk into. That would be look into, uh, look space. Uh, and the, the rule of thirds composition is really a nice way to have an interesting, somewhat dynamic, rather than just a simple boring. He is in, he is in the middle of the shot. You know, yes. Yeah, but if I sit off here like that, you know, kind of. Sorry, I'm getting used to this space over here. It's backwards as I'm sitting here looking at myself. So uh, be aware of look space. You know, the ideas of the basic shot composition, uh, where you. Um, you know, on that uh, slideshow that I posted, uh, you want to make sure you use the right cutoff lines, you know, like right here, uh, right here. You can even do closure, uh, get closure, like getting close ups on the face. But don't cut me off on my neck because it looks like a floating head. Don't cut me off at the knees, you know, cut me off at the waist. Uh, you know, just, you know, they're aesthetically pleasing uh, cutoff lines. Uh, also, composition, remember how you use space. Um, the whole slideshow is there. Uh, a gimbal. A gimbal is a device that helps to maintain the steadiness of your camera as you move around. Um, and it, it allows for turning up and down, left and right, uh, to keep a balanced looking shot. Tripod, three legs. It'll to put your camera on, to hold your camera steady. A monopod, a single stick up that you rest on the ground and then you can use it to brace while you hold your camera uh, steady. Again, to help make you have, to help you have a more pleasant, more balanced start, not balanced, that's not the word I'm looking for, but a steady shot. Uh, lighting, standard three point lighting, key fill and back. Main light is your key, uh, light over here for fill and then a back light to separate. Uh, you know, separate you from the background. You've seen the videos that I posted on that. Uh, diffusion. Now, diff diffusion is when you use a reflecting, like bouncing light off of a surface that breaks up the direct light rays, or you put it through a diffuser filter that kind of randomizes the light. It makes for softer lighting. Uh, if you notice now, uh, the sun has gone down. You don't have the harsh shadows that we used to have. I was very direct light, but now you can see in my eyes. It's more diffused light because it's uh, bouncing off of the elements around me. So that would be more of a diffused light. Uh, softens the shadows, I think makes for a more pleasant uh, view. The But, you know, if you want harsh shadows, then you want a more direct light. Uh, direct light, like we talked about, reflected light. Uh, it usually does produce a diffusion. Uh, you can, let's say if I had a light over here, I might shoot the light right here, but then use a reflector over here on this side to, this would be my key, but also use a reflected light to make my fill. Uh, I would, whenever I would light in a room, I would, rather than try to set up a triangular light on the area, I would do a lot of bounce light off the ceiling and then just use a little bit of light to get rid of kunais and things like that. But uh, still, you know, so I didn't have black spots around the eyes um, like a mask, you know. Uh, so I'd use a little bit of low-level lighting, but most of the light came from bouncing light off the ceiling where the other lights were anyway, just increasing the overall level of lighting. Um, field of view. Well, what you're looking at is the field of view of this camera. It's the area that is, okay, that you actually see. You know, that's your field of view, what you see through the camera. Uh, the aspect ratio is a ratio of height to width. Uh, standard for us now in HD is 9 by 16. Older format would have been 3 by 4. This depends on 
what you're trying to uh, shoot for. Focal length, the length of the lens. You know how that works. Remember, the short focal length is like me having my fingers right up here next to my eye. But then if I move it out, that's a longer focal length. And let me see if I can get my... And now, you see, it goes from being now, but I, what I see in here is just barely my head, as opposed to now, I can see the whole computer. That type of thing. All right, let's see. I'm going through more of the terms. Um, let me see. Uh, exposure and f-stop. The f-stop is uh, inversely related to the size of the aperture. For the so, the lower the f-stop, the bigger the aperture, and vice versa. Uh, just help that remember that when you're thinking in terms of your depth of field. Uh, resolution: the amount of detail in a shot. I mean, in an actual image. Uh, and I mean detail by pixels. Uh, standard definition is 480. Uh, for video and HD begins at 720 lines, uh, 1080 lines. Now we've got 2K and 4K uh, lines of resolution. The more lines you have, the better the detail. Um, condenser mic, dynamic mic. Okay, these are two type of microphones that you might use for production. A condenser mic requires a battery or some sort of power. It has a, uh, a better, it's, it has better frequency response, but it's also more expensive. It's a little bit more fragile. A dynamic microphone is still a good microphone. In fact, there's some applications where I prefer a, uh, a uh, dynamic microphone. But they're kind of like the, the handheld mics you would see somebody pick up. And uh, they are also more durable, less expensive, and they have a good frequency response, especially for the vocal ranges. Now, uh, one thing about condenser mics is they can be made very small. So if you're wearing like a lapel or trying to use a small mic that doesn't really stand out, uh, you know, like a mic on the end of a boom or something like that, that would probably be a condenser mic. Uh, ambient and natural sound. Well, as we're sitting out here, you may hear the birds back here. You may hear the traffic. It provides the sound of the environment. Now, the important thing about that is that the sound of the environment helps you get a sense of location for what's going on. Uh, if you're telling a story, let's say if you're talking about a basketball game and you're doing a report, well, to hear the squeak of sneakers on the, uh, on the court, the bouncing of the ball. In fact, when we're shooting a game, we actually put a microphone on the backboard to hear the thunk and brrr, you know as the uh, ball hits the backboard and then are some and it slams that down on the hoop and then you hear the rattle you know so all these elements help provide the atmosphere for what's going on linear and nonlinear editing uh, linear editing is basically uh, not used much anymore it's the old uh, tape style editing uh, yes, we actually used to edit on videotape. And the reason it's called linear is because you did a linear fashion. You started here, and then you added this, and you added this part, and this part, and you built it in a line, linear. Uh, nowadays, we use computers. So I work on this part, and then I work on this part, and then I can grab this and shift it over here and move things around. And uh, we don't work in a linear fashion, building bit by bit by bit in order. We can manipulate and change things around and we're not confined to a linear structure in the editing process. So um, to simplify it, linear editing is usually tape-based. Uh, Nonlinear editing is computer-based. Uh, a jump cut. A jump cut has always been bad in our business, but now it's become more acceptable. It's basically when, uh, let's say, I'm talking to you, and then I have to cut, and then I have to cut to another part where I may be looking like this, or I may be looking like this. Who knows what I'm doing? You know, so I, you know, you cut out the bad parts, if you will, the changes, and then you jump to the next thing. It's still not considered the best technique for video, but it's become an acceptable part of, uh, of online communication uh, so that people don't have to, uh, you know, do a cutaway. You, like in news and when we do all that, we used to always have cutaways. You didn't want to have a jump cut, have the head suddenly pop. But 
it's considered more and more acceptable within the uh, uh, online community and uh, as part of the language. It's a way to compress, uh, so you don't have somebody going, uh, uh, and then you can include that because you don't have something to cover that shot with, and then you go to the next thing. You know, you don't have to, you can cut that out if you want to. Uh, rendering. Okay. Rendering is when you're building your timeline. Remember, your timeline is that list of commands that you're, as you're doing your video editing. Rendering is where you generate the new pieces of video for the changes that you have made. Let's say you zoom in on, on a piece of your video. Well, it won't do that in real time, or it, can, it really takes a lot of the resources to do that in real time. So you do a rendering or go through and generate a new piece of video for where you fix that. Let's say you added a, a title. Let's say you put in a dissolve. Well, it has to render that dissolve out. And so when it comes time to export, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, it'll take you know the, the, uh, the original video, then the new video you generated for the dissolve, original video, now you're going to bring in a title, so it generates a new piece of video under that title. You know, you know what I'm saying. So uh, that's the rendering process. And generally when I'm editing, I will render, uh, I just periodically render, so that when the time comes at the end, I'm not rendering a huge amount of stuff before I can start exporting. But I've made the mistake of trying to export before I had fully rendered things, and it takes a long time and can cause some uh, shutdowns. So I go through and render, make sure everything's rendered out. Uh, Periodic, periodically until I finish my project. Then it comes time to export. Now export, remember when you're editing, you're not making a new show. When you're editing, you're setting up a series of commands saying, do this to these files. Drop in this title over the file. Do this blending between these two files as you go from one to the other video files. So you have this series of instructions. When you export, you tell the computer, okay, you know all that stuff we, all those commands I set up in the timeline? Do it. And what the computer does, the software will then take all your original files and manipulate them and generate a new show, a completely new file of the show that you just edited. You see, your timeline, all you're doing is you're working with your original content and you're doing things, you're telling it to do stuff to it. But it hasn't done it yet until you export. And in the export, you're generating a whole new file with all the adjustments made. Now this is important because if you're exporting back to your computer, you got to make sure you have enough available memory on your hard drive for that new show to land. So as you, let's say if you're in Adobe Premiere, uh, look down at the file, you know, it says uh, at the bottom uh, in the export um, window, it'll show estimated file size, and it may be four or five gig. Well, that's great. But if you only have three gig left of memory on your computer, you're gonna have a problem. So make sure you have plenty of space available for that show to render out to. Um, I've had some shows back in the days when I was working in uh, MPEG-2, I would have a, our uh, AVI files, I would have a 40 gig file when I do a render, and then I'd have to do an export, uh, a re, I'd have to compress that file to make it fit on, on a, uh, pardon me, on a DVD. This is what we used to have to do for graduation many years ago. Back about 10, 12 years ago when I first got here. Actually, this is my end of my 14th year. So, yeah, it was about four, 13, 14 years ago. We would have to take an AVI file, and then after we rendered it, we'd have to compress it. Well, now uh, you, you actually can export as a compressed file, which is great. You've got MPEG-4 and you've got other formats. You need to make sure of what your destination needs in the export. If you're sending it, like when we used to send to uh, NRB Television Network when I used to edit a show for them, uh, you know, we'd, I'd have to say, okay, what are your specs? And they want, uh, they said they wanted H.264 uh, with a, um, and they wanted it in 480. 
they want it in standard definition for uh, their distribution. So make sure of what you need, your client needs for the export. Now, a word of advice, I would suggest that you always export a copy of whatever work you do for someone else in the highest resolution possible. I made the mistake of not doing that. I did a, a, edited a show for a band, uh, just one song they wanted on their website. Well, at that time, bandwidth was very limited if you were on the internet, and I did it in low res. Well, now it really looks bad, especially when I show it on the big screen. They just wanted this little square, you know, on their page, let's see, right, right, right here, of their band. They weren't going to click it out and make it wide. They just wanted that sample of their music on their page. Well, it looked fine, you know, if you're looking at a 13-inch monitor and you have a little 2 by, uh, you know, 2 inch by 3 and a half inch uh, image. It looks horrible when you're dealing with an image that is four feet across on the bottom. So, and I, I don't have a good original just because I like the piece. So make sure you always export, have your archival drives that you save stuff to that uh, in a high uh, quality format. Uh, I mentioned the timeline and that's in the exporting. Remember your project's not finished until you've exported it because you really don't have a show until you do your final export. Timeline is that set of instructions that you work with on your uh, your timeline, whether if you're in Adobe Premiere, uh, Final Cut, whatever it might be. Uh, Keyframes, whenever you're doing movements or animations or want an effect to happen, you have to set up keyframes in your timeline of where you want those things to happen. Uh, cache memory. Cache memory is in your computer it had, you have your, your memory on your hard drive, and then you have in your processor, right next to your processor, you have uh, some, some memory available. And so instead of having to always go to the hard drive, your computer will work in the cache memory to manip manipulate things around and make it work faster. Um, but if you always leave your computer on, this is especially true, I've seen this especially true with PC-based products. Not as much with Mac, but it does come into play with Mac. Sometimes when uh, the old line of, oh, it's not working, what, what does the computer person do? Well, he reboots. Well, that's basically what you need to do often because when you reboot, it dumps everything in the cache memory and clears it up. But if you process a lot of video, it dumps more and more stuff and fills up that cache memory, and then it gets kind of sluggish. So periodically, you know, sometimes I have to shut down. Um, what, for one example, I was working with one client uh, this was uh, back in Texas, so that was a good <laughs> 24 years ago. Uh, and they had practiced their show, and this was the big wigs. This was the, you know, the CEO and all that for this local branch coming in. And uh, in the middle of the show, uh, the computer froze up, and the woman was like, "Oh no!" And you know what it's like in corporate life and stress. And I said. Uh, she said, we practiced all afternoon. It never did this. And I said, that's why it's doing this. I said, can you stall for about five minutes? Let's restart the computer and we'll be fine. And uh, so we, uh, so she said, oh, we had te technical difficulties. We'll be right. We'll be right. And somebody went up. And... Good old ambient sound right there. I love it when they come down here by my house at one o'clock in the morning like that. The uh, anyway, so uh, they went and filled up for about five minutes, and we, sh you know, closed down the computer and restarted and went to it, picked it up, and everything worked smoothly. Well, what happened was all the times that they were practicing, they were dumping a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more into that cache memory and chewing it up. So when it came time for the show, there was no cache memory left. So when we restarted it, it cleared out the cache memory and everything did what it was supposed to. In fact, they were so happy. She said, you know, I like your voice. Maybe we need to have you as a uh, uh, work as a spokesman for our company. Given that they were the local beer distributor, I said, well, thank you for the offer. But I don't know if the church where I'm serving, how they would feel about that. <laughs> I was a bivocational minister at the time. Uh, so <laughs> I can see me walking around as a 
beer spokesman yet. No, that what's not going to work. Anyway, but you can really look like a hero if you know these kind of tidbits. So, uh, cash memory, yeah. Uh, the old line of, oh, oh, it's not working. Well, then re uh, disconnect the battery and restart. Sometimes that's really what it needs. Uh, I've had that happen with my phone. My phone will start getting really, really sluggish, and it won't work. Uh, sometimes that's just a problem with memory being chewed up, and if it's been left on for a long time and you shot a lot of video, it, it, it finally says, I've had enough of this and it needs to be restarted. So just something to think about. Um, so those are all the terms that are listed in the glossary. I hope this little tour, guide, tour helps you with uh, figuring out uh, and getting ready for the exam. God bless you all. Take care.